name is Carmen Bolt, the oral historian at William & Mary. It is currently around 10 a.m. on May 18th, 2017. I'm sitting with Sybil Shanewald in her home in New York City. So can we start by you telling me the date and place of your birth? <laughs> it's a long time ago. Uh, I was born in uh, New York City in 1928. April 27th, 1928. And what years did you... Um, I attended William & Mary from 1945 to 1948. I went to William & Mary because I graduated early. In the days that I went to high school and junior high school, they had rapid advance classes, so you could make up a year or so. And the only place that was accepting mid-year students was William & Mary. So I said, well, that's the place for me. <laughs> so you just looked at a number of different schools and found that William & Mary was the only one that you would... I looked at Swarthmore. I looked at, at, you know, I looked at other schools that I, you know, I was like 15 and a half, so, and there were no guidance counselors. But William & Mary sounded fine to me, so that's where I went. Well, I definitely want to talk more about that, but first, um, would you tell me a little bit more about how you were raised and about your family? I was raised in, in New York, uh, Manhattan. I went to elementary school here. I started junior high school here. Then my father died. And eventually my mother, my brother and I moved to be near my grandmother in Brooklyn. And I went to James Madison High School. So you graduated early, um, you were younger than 16, Yes. and what was your mother and family's reaction to you going to college so early? My mother was fine, uh, you know, I, I wasn't too happy at William & Mary to begin with, but uh, because I came mid-semester and they uh, didn't have guidance counselors and so you had to take the second half of everything. Um, my mother was fine, my brother couldn't care less, <laughs> so, so it, it was out. my decision and that was it. Great. Um, one of my questions was, how did William & Mary get on your radar, but I guess you've already mentioned that, but you were 16 years old, around about you were going to school miles and miles away. How did that impact, how did your age and the distance impact your experience at William & Mary? Well, what really I think impacted me was the fact that I had to take the second half of everything. And, um, but everything else seemed to be fine. Uh, I did not like William and Mary when I got there. My husband always called it Mary and William. But uh, I wanted to go home. I called my mother right away. I was allowed 50 cents to make a, the call. And uh, this was in a mid-year admission. So I said to my mother, I said, I absolutely hate this school. And I want to leave. I will go to New York University. I will go to Barnard. But I have to come back to New York. And the reason that I did not like it was there was segregation. And I came from a very liberal high school, the same high school that Bernie Sanders went to. And um, we weren't in the same class. He's young. Everyone is younger than I am. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it, was, it was very liberal. I had a very liberal upbringing. I belonged to various organizations. I worked on political, you know, on uh, political activities and so on. So William and Mary was not... Um, I just felt uncomfortable because particularly because of the segregation. Sure, that's understandable. So if you called your mother and were wanting to leave, what made you say? My mother said, wait till your birthday in April. Everything will be all right. And then I met a, a, a male student. And so that, that made a change. And, you know, I, I sort of felt that uh, William Mary had a very good history department. I had a very good history teacher in high school, and so I had decided to major in history, and I knew that William and Mary had a specialty, so I stayed. Great. 
three and a half years, not four. <laughs> three and a half years. So if we can go back to that very beginning of your time at William Mary, do you recall your very first memory of being on campus, what it looked like or smelled like, just the very first impression you had? Well, I was in a very old dorm and um, it wasn't as beautiful as it is today. It is really a beautiful, beautiful campus today. Um, the town was very, um, it's not as big as it is today. There weren't a lot of restaurants or, you know, things I was used to in New York. Um, it was fine. I was there, you know, uh, I was there to get an education. But I always worked. I worked in a little store in town, and then I worked for Professor Adair, a history professor. I started out babysitting for him, then I got to grading papers for him, then I got to really, you know, be like his, I don't know whether you would call it an assistant because I wasn't a graduate student or anything. But uh, he asked me to write a chapter um, on James Thompson Callender, who was a yellow journalist in Jefferson's time. And Dumas Malone, a well-known historian, was publishing a book and was waiting for the chapter, he said. But I changed my topic, so that never got <laughs> quite finished. Did he pick it up where you left off and finish it? Somebody picked it up because um, somebody did, but by the time I graduated, I decided I did not want to be in early American history. And my professor at Columbia was Richard Hofstadter. And I started out, and I had done all the research on this yellow journalist, but I said, I did not want to be an 18th century girl. I am not an 18th century girl. I am a 20th century. <laughs> And I went to him with a list of topics. He told me to do research on 10 topics. And, but I, uh, I said, no, I'm not doing that. And uh, I went with mainly women's issues. Uh, but my husband was working at the at Consumers Union. So uh, he went down the whole list of uh, women were very responsible for social change in the 30s and 40s. And I thought that would be a really interesting topic for me uh, because I had interviewed some of them and um, admired a lot of them and I think they stood for social justice and change but uh, Professor Hofstadter picked the consumer movement in America. So that was my topic in graduate school. Great. And it sounds like really you made a career out of different consumer products and women's rights issues? Well, I was always interested in women's rights issues. So you mentioned that during your time at William Mary, by the time you were about to graduate, you no longer wanted to be um, an 18th century girl. That's right. Were, was there anything or any notable professors at William and Mary that led to that change, that led to that shift in your interests? I don't think it was, I had a very good um, education at William & Mary, an excellent education. But I took uh, um, a lot of history courses. I also took physics and calculus because I think that was, I thought that that was a good thing, that everybody should learn everything. <laughs> so <laughs> I took that. And um, the only course that I think I got, I decided that all of this, my friends who were seniors before we graduated, they were taking easier courses. So I decided I would take a home economics course. And this was my undoing. I took sewing. And the only B I think I got was in sewing. I put the sleeves in pajamas about 11 times. But uh, I did graduate. Home <laughs> With, economics did not keep you down. Well, I learned very quickly that that wasn't my career. So, during your 
during your time while you were getting your education at William & Mary, do you recall any important advisors or mentors you had? I think Professor um, Adair was a good, excellent mentor for me. Um, I recall that I did like my professors. I did like my courses. Um, it's different now. You don't, you, there were no such thing as guidance counselors or advisors and you picked your courses and took what interested you. What about since then? You mentioned your professor at Columbia who helped you get on a new track with your studies. Any other notable mentors since you left William and Mary? Well, Professor Hofstadt hit Columbia had a great history department. Henry Steele Commenter, uh, Liam Luchtenberg, Richard Hofstadter, Alan Evans, I, you know, somebody else's name, but um, I, whose name I cannot remember, but um, it really was a wonderful uh, history department. And I decided, because I was active in political movements, I decided that I would should be a lawyer because every time I needed help with something, I had to call the ACLU or somebody from another organization. And uh, Columbia had a joint, the graduate faculties had a joint program with Columbia Law School. So I went to Columbia Law School and I said, I'd like to take the joint program and get the two degrees. And they said to me, in 1961, you will take the place of a man who will practice law for 40 years. But I practiced law for more than 40 years. So you were able to eventually go and get your JD, even though they did not allow you in that position when you applied? I was in the graduate faculties. I thought I was, I thought I was qualified, but I was the wrong gender. If they could see you now. So you mentioned you were very active um, socially. You were a social activist. You were very involved in different things like that. And I think you mentioned that that really started in high school. Um, did that continue while you were at William & Mary? Did you get involved in any sort of... Well, I worked on the flat hat. And uh, I can't wrote with an international relations, I think. But on the flat hat, um, we wrote an editorial. And it said that this was in 1947, a long time ago. But the editorial said, someday Negroes will come to this school the reaction was this. They closed the paper, they closed the school, and I think we had the first student strike in the country. New York newspapers came down. It was quite a deal. <laughs> oh my goodness, did you? That is why I didn't like William and Mary, by the way, because I didn't like segregation. I did not like unequal treatment of sexes, colors, races. Were you responsible for that article that was written? I was on the staff. I think the woman who did the final um, write-up on that was a woman named Marilyn Camerley. So they closed the school. They did. And they shut down the paper. And there yes. was a student protest. Did you participate in that protest? You bet. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more of what that looked like? That looked like. Well, you know, there was different. There were different feelings. A lot of the students came from the south, and they were accustomed to this. Um, but there were enough revolutionaries <laughs> to march, protest, and uh, close down the school. So that was it. So the school closed well, as a result of the article or as a result of the protest? I, both, I guess. Really both. But. When did they reopen the newspaper? I can't really remember that. I don't recall the time. But uh, it, was a, it was a correct protest. And of course, William and Mary has changed. Uh, 
I went back a few years ago before my granddaughter entered the school, and I was very glad to see that uh, there were mixed couples. You know, there was there was no prejudice there. So you were pleasantly. I was very pleasantly surprised. I gave a talk on reproductive rights, and that's, which is something I do a lot. But um, that was very good to see. Wow. Do you recall there being any other protests or activism during your time at William & Mary? There was activism. I mean, I was always active in political activities. And I was active on the paper and various clubs. There were, you know, there were, if you wanted to participate, there were a lot of, uh, were, I thought, worthwhile things to do. But at the time, they also made us take a sport, which I understand they don't, do not require anymore. So I took lacrosse and fencing. <laughs> I can't even imagine that, but there it is. Did you fall in love with those sports and continue? Absolutely them? not. <laughs> I took them because I, you had to take a certain amount of sports. So you did not find an affinity for either of those sports following your education? No. Um, you were mentioning having a lot of organizations to choose from to get involved in. And yes. One of the things I noticed when I was doing some research was that you were quite involved in a number of different things. I have a list here. It includes the Flat Hat, as we were saying, the International Relations Club, the Balfour Hillel Club, the Spanish Club, the Colombia. I, I have no idea why I was in the Spanish Club. <laughs> but, all right. Um, you were the secretary treasurer of the World Federalists. That's true. And while you were involved in all these things, you were a President Bryan Scholar. You graduated Phi Beta Kappa in the top of your class. So what is it that motivated you to be so involved in so many different things? I was particularly interested in the World Federalists. I just thought if there could be one world and if people could be at peace, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, the Spanish Club, I have no idea why I joined that. Um, what, what, tell me again what some of the other, the flat hat, of course, I enjoyed. You worked um, on the Colonial Echo as well? Well, the yearbook, yes. Mm -hmm. The International Relations Club? That I liked a lot. Right. What sort of activities did you do? I guess we had meetings to make a better world. Seems like a theme in the things you were involved in. Yes, I was always interested in really the more or less the same things. Making a better world is a good thing to be interested in. And then also the Balfour Hillel Club, which was a Jewish organization. Yes, but it's one that I didn't really recall, so. I had one question about it, and you might not recall, um, as you say, but I was wondering if you had any recollection of it being. Oh, I know why I joined the Balfour Hillel sure. Club. There were very few Jewish, I am not really a religious person. But there were very few Jewish um, girls, as we used to call them. Um, and they came to me, and they, they were, there were two Jewish fraternities out of all, it's a big sorority fraternity school. And um, the Jewish girls on campus came to me and said, uh, we want to form a Jewish sorority, because Jews were not admitted into any sorority. So I said, no, I don't believe in sororities. So I was persona non grata. <laughs> but um, they, I, they formed a kind of club. I don't know if they actually formed a Jewish sorority, and I don't know what the current state, I'm sure they're mixed now. Um, but at the time, um, there weren't many Jews at William & Mary. And I wasn't really brought up in a religious household, but I felt it was unequal treatment. So when you joined the Balfour Hillel Club, do you remember participating in other activities or becoming close friends with the individuals from that club? 
I don't really recall. I probably went to their meetings as a form of protest that they didn't have any other Jewish organizations. <laughs> Small, the, small, because very few Jews, there would, as I say, two Jewish fraternities, but very few Jewish uh, women. Sure. So I wanted to broaden this a little bit, and this is more an opportunity for reflection, but do you have any favorite memories of your time at William and Mary? I do have good memories of my time at William and Mary. Even though I was disappointed when I first arrived, uh, I found the education to be outstanding. I found the professors I had to be outstanding. I thought the campus was beautiful. The town really was not the same as it is now. There were really were, you know, the restaurants they have and all of that. But um, I did think that I was getting a very good education, particularly in early American history. Fun. Well, apparently I worked for <laughs> the flat. <laughs> no, I, I, for fun, there wasn't that much to do in the town at the time. I mean, in the 40s, there wasn't that much to do. I mean, um, I did, the, I think I did a lot of the things that uh, young women do today. You go with, out with your friends or I don't remember going to the movies there. That's what I don't remember. So uh, they the movies are probably uh, younger than I am. <laughs> well, it brings up a good question, actually. Um, what women were and were not allowed to do during this period of time, because I recognize that curfews were still in place I and forgot dress codes were still in place. Would you speak a little bit about what that was like at William and Mary? I forgot about the curfews, but yes, you had to be in your dorm. I thought, I think you had to sign in. And um, I wasn't used to that either. So that was extremely annoying. But uh, they had rules and regulations, a lot more than they have now. Do you remember what you were and were not allowed to wear? I don't think we were allowed to wear pants. I, is that correct? Um, I'm just nodding, but I would say that probably was yeah. part of the dress code. I mean, you had to wear, uh, as I recall, I know what I had to wear in high school, but I think at William and Mary I had to wear a skirt. Do you recall there being any sort of backlash or um, pushback to those rules and regulations at the time you were there? Well, I didn't bring any pants with me because I knew that William Mary was a conserv you know, more conservative in the dress code. Uh, and um, after all, it was Virginia, and the culture was really different from where I lived in New York. Sure. So, was talking a little bit about fond memories you have of William and Mary, but and you have expressed that there was some difficulty when you started attending the school, but do you have any specific experiences that you can point to that were very difficult for you, other than arriving and noticing the segregation? Any specific event? Well, I had to, when I arrived, um, because I graduated uh, mid-year, I had to take the second half of everything. So um, that, was a, that was a little difficult, but. It, it was, it was a, turned out to be okay. Um, I mean, they didn't make, at that time, they didn't make any um, provision for incoming students mid-year. But it was one of the few colleges that really admitted students mid-year. So. so you, technically attended William and Mary Wright in post-war era. Um, do you recall what it was like to be a Jewish student at William and Mary in the post-war era. You already mentioned that there were very few Jewish students, but do you remember anything specific about the experience of being a Jewish student at William and Mary? Well, 
Well, I was never really a religious Jew, so, uh, and nor did I know anybody that went to temple at William and Mary. Um, I didn't really feel prejudice at William and Mary. I was um, upset that they um, didn't have that Jewish girls, as we were called then, were not admitted to sororities. I didn't want to join a sorority, but the it, the, it should have been open to whoever wanted to join, regardless of race, color, creed, right? And um, that, that did bother me, because there were some uh, young women I knew who did want to join a sorority, and that's why they started a Jewish sorority. I really don't believe that sorority should be, or fraternity should be Christian or Jewish or black or white or anything else. theme that sometimes arises um, when discussing co-education at a school is the topic of sexual harassment. Sometimes those sorts of events occur at co-educational college campuses. Do you recall any sexual harassment or events of sexual assault on college during your time there? I really don't. I really do not recall that at William Mary. I mean, I think that the male students were gentlemen for the most part, and uh, I don't recall any any sexual harassment at William Mary. Okay. So now, just feeling of danger or potential of those sorts of things happening. No, not really. So we can shift a little bit if you want to your life and career trajectory following William and Mary. Um, you began a graduate program at Columbia University and wrote a thesis on the history of consumer movement in America. Yes. Why did you choose that topic? You mentioned that you were moving away from the 18th century and you had a professor that sort of led you to... I had the professor. I had Professor Richard Hofstadter as my advisor. How lucky can you be? And, um, but he died in the middle of my doing my graduate work, and then I didn't get as good an, as, as an advisor. But, um, could you repeat your question, please? Sure. Why did you choose the topic of the consumer movement in America? Uh, Richard Hofstadter chose it for me. I was more interested in women's rights. So do you believe that focusing on the consumer movement for your thesis informed your career trajectory at all, led you to this intersection of women's rights and the consumer movement? Well, the women who I interviewed, who I did oral history interviews, and was women who were active in the milk consumer whatever, Cooperative, I think it was called the Milk Cooperative. Um, and um, women, women were the social leaders in the 30s and 40s. And I decided that uh, it was time to interview the pioneers of the consumer movement. There were some men. I interviewed Stuart Chase and Fred Schlink, who wrote a book in 1927 called Your Money's Worth. And they said in the book, uh, someday consumers will band together and they will pay a dollar each to get results. And uh, the book was a bestseller. So they did band together. And um, first there was consumers research in New Jersey and then there was a strike at consumers research and the strikers broke off and formed Consumers Union in 1936. So. so, you mentioned a little earlier that you applied for the joint um, program to get your JD because you recognized that you had to keep working through ACLU. Well, there were a lot of uh, things. I mean, um, um, for example, during the Vietnam War, 
which I was vehemently opposed, as was my family. And uh, every time I needed to keep somebody out of jail, or <laughs> I needed to call a lawyer, from, usually from the American Civil Liberties Union. And so I said, uh, because I was interested in the subject anyway, because I, I think you can do a lot with a law degree in the area, uh, in the area that I was interested in. Um, so well, I decided, why shouldn't I be a lawyer? And there was a bit of a halt, I imagine, in that pursuit when they did not admit you into the program because you were a female. What was... I said that, yeah, I said to my husband, I said, well, I guess I'll have to be a historian the rest of my life. So I applied for a grant to the National Endowment for the Humanities. And lo and behold, <laughs> Uh, they called me up and they said, I wrote the grant. And the call I got from NEH was, Mrs. Shane will we like your proposal, but it's too ambitious. So I said, no, 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 it's not, it's not. I figured it all out, I can do all those things, it's fine. So his name was Jeff Fields, a very nice man. And um, he kept saying to me, no, your program is too ambitious. We've all, we've all looked at it, we like it, but you have to cut it. I kept saying no, and then finally he said to me, we'll give you $15,000 if you'll allow us to cut it down. <laughs> we'll send you somebody from the Physics Association. So I said, if they're going to give me $15,000, they're going to give me a quarter of a million dollars, which is what I applied for. So this woman came, she cut it down, and I did exactly what I wanted to do in the original proposal. <laughs> so you worked your way around it. What well, was the original pr proposal? The proposal was to do uh, oral histories and to collect libraries, books, and to set up a center for the study of the consumer movement at Consumers Union, which I did. I was always interested in history, and it seemed to me that this was a um, very worthwhile historical project because I believed that the consumer movement uh, did have a great influence on American life. Do you recall what type of oral histories you collected? What types of stories? Yes, I do. And I had, and I had a great book collection. I also, uh, what type? The first technical director, the first, um, um, the first executive director, um, the first president. The president of Consumers Union for from 1936 to the 1980s was a man named Colston Warren. And uh, he was an absolutely fabulous man. And when he heard that I wanted to do this, he came for lunch at our house. And I was a nervous wreck. The president of Consumers Union was coming. So anyway, he came with two briefcases from Amherst. And I started to call him Dr. Warren. He said, I won't answer to that. I will only answer to Colston. So I said, I can't, I can't call you Colston. So anyway, uh, we got through the lunch and I asked him what was in the briefcases. And he said, all the things I'm just giving to researchers or, so I said, do you mind if I look? So he said, no. So when I opened the briefcases, they were letters from Eleanor Roosevelt, Rexford Tugwell, Stuart Chase, everybody, you know, Helen Hall, everybody in the consumer movement, and, and otherwise very politically active people whose names I knew. But anyway, so I said to him, would you mind leaving me th these briefcases? And he said, yes. And I said, uh, would you mind if I came up to Amherst next weekend? And he said, that would be fine. And I knew I had like, you know, as a historian, I knew I had struck gold, so. What did you end up using those documents for? I used the documents as background for oral history interviews, and he, we went together to do those interviews. So that was the most interesting thing. And uh, then I used them to write articles and um, they're, at, they're at Consumers Union today. Great. 
I'll have to look into this. What do you think the value of recording oral histories as opposed to just writing down their stories was? You, well, just like now, you want to talk to the person, you want to see the person's reaction, and sometimes people dredge up memories that they had forgotten about, depending on the questions. And um, Columbia University did not look kindly upon these as scholarly. Uh, they now give a degree in oral history, by the way, but at that time, they didn't, this did not count toward your education. But it was really very interesting. I was work, actually, I was working in my basement, which was cold. <laughs> and uh, uh, finally, I thought to myself, I should really apply for a grant. And that's when I applied to the National Endowment. And they thought it was worthwhile, too. So. Clearly. Well, that's fantastic. I love, obviously, I love hearing other individual stories about oral history. I also collect a lot of books from the pioneers of the consumer movement. I also collected the technical, early technical records, you know, and other records from the departments. So. That's great. Do you still have those? Consumers Union has them. Consumers Union has them. Great. So how then from your... Oh, I, I, I just want to say that I had the most fabulous board of advisors. Um, Kenneth Galbraith, other names you might not recognize, um, Leonard Silk, um, but you know, a very good, wonderful board of advisors, very supportive, very interested in the project, so I was very fortunate. It's great to have that kind of support. Yes, it was very important. Wonderful. Because the executive director at the time was not interested in history, so having big names on letterheads and they also came to meetings, so that was really amazing. Good individuals to have in your corner. Excellent. Right. How then did you go from working with the Consumers Union on these projects to getting your JD and starting to practice law? I was, I, well in 1972, I thought I could never practice law. But my youngest daughter was in the sixth grade, and she came home, and she told me that her teacher was going to law school at night. So I said, I called her up. I'm supposed to see her tonight, so you know how long ago this was. Um, I said, Mrs. Netter, Washa told me you are going to law school at night, and I would like to know what I have to do uh, to follow in your path. So she said, well, you have to go to Princeton tomorrow and, <laughs> and register for the LSATs. So uh, I said, okay. And um, I left a note on the kitchen table for my husband. Gone to Princeton, be back when I'm back. And then I, uh, it was too late to take the LSATs, uh, the courses. So my husband said, don't worry, I'll help you study. And uh, I applied to one law school because I really didn't want to waste money. Like I had applied to Columbia Law School, I thought, well, it was, um, it, I didn't want to waste money. I just applied to the same law school that Mrs. Netta was going to. So I got into that law school. So I worked at Consumers Union during the day and I went to law school at night, four nights a week for four years. Wow. But it was fine. I got my degree, right. And you began to practice law. Well, I was sitting at dinner. I said, I really don't want to work in a male firm. But I was sitting at dinner uh, with friends of ours from Scarsdale. And the man was probably the best trial lawyer in New York. His name was Alfred Julian. And he said to me, sweetheart, why don't you come to work for me? And I said, sweetheart, doesn't want to work for anybody. <laughs> so he said, well, he said, I said, I will take office space with you. So he said, we've never done that. 
I said, well, if you want sweetheart, you'll have to do that. So we said, come down and talk to my partner. So the office was at 2 Lafayette Street, which, and I lived in Westchester. So I went down, and they gave me an office, and it was at no pay, which is the way Sandra Day O'Connor started out also. <laughs> um, not that I'm comparing myself. I'm not. I'm not. So uh, anyway, um, there, was, there was a lot of prejudice against women lawyers, which there is not now, but there was then. At any rate, um, um, I started out and he gave me some, he gave me first, the first thing he gave me was an appeal. I didn't even know coming out of law school what an appeal was, <laughs> but okay. You learned quickly on the job. I was the only woman, there were seven men and me, and that is how I got the first GES case. Um, nobody wanted it, nobody thought it would succeed, so they gave it to me. <laughs> and uh, the woman was Joyce Bickler, who I'm still friendly with from those days, and a wonderful woman, really wonderful, and she was 17 and a half when her she got clear cell adenocarcinoma, which is a signature disease that you get from taking diethylsilbestrol, which was given to six million women in this country to prevent miscarriages, even though they knew everything about it before Mrs. Bickler took the pill. So anyway, I was given that case, and uh, that was my first big case. It went to the um, um, it was tried in the Bronx in the summer, but they sent a very smart judge. Now I had gone to see the pharmacist, and he said, "I only carry Louis the best." So the judge reverse bifurcated it, and the first question to the jury was, "Did Mrs. Bickler take Eli Lilly's pill?" And the jury came back and said no. <laughs> because when the pharmacist got on the stand, he said, I carried four brands, which is not what he told me. And he left for Israel the next day. So I, I always thought that somehow he was paid off. But anyway, so the judge said to, the judge said to me, we'll start with your new theory uh, on Monday. Well, I didn't know what new theory I had, but I had put a sentence in the complaint that in the event the pill was not identified, uh, or something like all the drug companies will be proven negligent. So <laughs> uh, at the end of the plaintiff's case, he said to me, you don't really have a theory. So I said, uh, yes, I do. I will give you a brief. And Eli Lilly was the opponent, and they had what they called a CP around the corner. And to me, CP meant Communist Party, but they had a command post. So every day they would put a brief on my desk. And first I answered them, and then I finally said, I can't answer these briefs and prepare. So I stopped answering them. I said, this is not going to make a big difference to this judge. And um, at any rate, I read all the articles I could. And I relied heavily on a Fordham Law Review article by a woman named Naomi, well, Naomi Scherer, I think it was. Uh, and she laid out all the theories that for products that where well, you didn't know the name of the product. And this was the first trial in the country where the manufacturer was not known to the, uh, you know, not known, not. So uh, we went along for about five weeks in July in the Bronx, and uh, the jury was out about a week, I think. And the judge posed the questions, to which I objected, of course, but he was right. And the first question was, did Mrs. Bickler take, uh, did Mrs. Bickler take Eli Lilly's pill? Um, uh, did, I don't remember the second question, but I do remember the third question. 
Would a reasonably prudent drug company have tested DES on pregnant mice before marketing them to pregnant women? And I said, if this Bronx jury, I said to myself, answers yes, then forget about the rest of it. And uh, they answered yes. It was amazing to me. And the last question was, did the drug company act in concert? And the jury answered yes. And they, Joyce Bickle was offered $100,000 by Lilly during the trial while the jury was out. And so we walked around, the Bronx County Courthouse has a rotunda. We walked around that rotunda a million times. And they were young, these were this young married couple. And Lilly offered $100,000. So they didn't know what to do. So they said, can you guarantee a jury verdict? I said, Joyce, nobody can guarantee a jury verdict. So I said, but if you don't take it and the jury rules in your favor, you will be a heroine forever. So you sleep on it and come back tomorrow. So they decided not to take it. So they got, they got what Lily called a compromise verdict, which was $500,000. So, and of course, Lily's lawyer said, I'll see you in the appellate division. I said, good. And the appellate division was unanimous in upholding the verdict. Then he said, I'll see you in the Court of Appeals. I said, good. <laughs> so, and the Court of Appeals was unanimous. So that was a very good beginning. Major victory. Yes, it was a major victory for and women. And that was your first court case? Post no, it wasn't really my first court case, but it was among the first. It was the, you know, um, had I, I was a trial assistant to the major partner in the firm, so I had been to court, but not on a pharmaceutical case, which is, which is very hard. You know, I always think that asbestos cases, which I turned down um, because I was doing women's health, uh, but uh, asbestos cases were reverse bifurcated, so the damages came first. So the, most of them settled. There were a few trials. I had one trial that I took. Women get lower verdicts than men. The, tre the, the asbestos case I took because the New York Public Interest Research Group sent it to me. They would have sent me all the asbestos cases, but I said, no, 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 you know. <laughs> so um, the asbestos case I took, there was a $5.9 million verdict. No woman has ever received that verdict for the injuries. Incredible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Inequality. Inequality. I was thinking about writing about that because I've had many trials and settlements and they don't, for the injuries that women sustain as a result of a, a totally untested drug, uh, it, you know, it's amazing. Cancer, infertility, miscarriages, death, nobody gets that. Yes, I did. I had many Dalkin Shield cases, many breast implant cases, and there, were in, there was an interesting article now that they are connecting breast implants to cancer. Just in yesterday's paper or the day before. And I read that the women you were helping went outside the United States, that you were also helping women in Bangladesh. Oh, India, I did. Kenya. Um, my husband was, was the um, associate director of Consumers Union. And uh, so a man from Bangladesh knew him because he traveled, he, he belonged to the international organization, my husband belonged to the international organization of Consumers Union. So he met this guy in Bangladesh and, you know, different people uh, around the world. So. This man calls me from Bangladesh, and he says, will you represent the women of Bangladesh? I say, sure. So <laughs> I sent them the forms to fill out. I brought them to Richmond, Virginia, where the, where the litigation was taking place in front of Judge Robert Marriage. 
And um, I got a call from the clerk of the court saying, Mrs. Shamewell, we cannot process the cases from Bangladesh. I said, what is the problem? We don't understand the addresses because the addresses were like the goom, somebody, you know, the woman's name, and then it would be three steps to the left of the concrete walk. So I called uh, Farhad Hug was his name. I called him up and I said, Farhad, we have a real problem. Nobody in Bangladesh will get money unless you come with me to Richmond and we straighten out the addresses. So he came, 10,000 miles, he came. We went to Richmond. We spent several days getting it together and they all got money. That's incredible. Now that was, it should be. Why should foreign women be treated differently from U.S. women? And in that litigation, they got, in that litigation, they got the same amount of money as New York women. So they were really rich in Bangladesh. You really evened the playing field there. Yeah, but in other litigation, like breast implant litigation, you couldn't. No matter what you did, you could not. The plaintiff's lawyers in the United States saw that there was a limited pie and the limited, most of the limited pie should go to the clients in the United States. But foreign women had the same injuries and with sold defective products. I mean, I came across a memo that said, defective sent to Mexico. And there were many like that. It's hard to believe. For me, I guess not for you, you've seen the memos. Yes. Wow. That sounds like you changed the lives of a lot of women. I hope so. I hope so. That was the purpose. Absolutely. So, what do you perceive as your greatest accomplishment in your career? Having four children <laughs> and having a wonderful husband. Um, well, if I've helped women recover money for their severe injuries, I'm very pleased with that. Um, it made a difference in a lot of women's lives because they needed treatment for infertility. They certainly needed treatment for cancer, they need, which was induced by DES. Uh, they needed treatment for the Dalkin Shield injuries, for the breast implant injuries. You know, uh, I did uh, have an emergency fund. Um, I must mention Judge Jack Weinstein, who is the senior judge in the Eastern District of New York. I started to bring cases in the state court and the federal court, and then I saw that in the federal court, the judge was much more sympathetic to the injuries and was an outstanding jurist. So I only brought cases in front of Judge Weinstein. And for example, the defendants at one point made 13 motions to dismiss. So in my office, they said, oh, we, there's no reason to oppose these. You know, I said, there's every reason. Put in the papers, and let's see what happens. So he didn't dismiss a single case. And he, he did more than that. What he did, I, I sent a letter to my clients saying, your case has been settled by an outstanding judge. Would you like to meet this judge? I asked the judge first, and I said, it will probably take an afternoon. Well, it took him four afternoons, and um, he gave, he talked to the mothers and the daughters, and there were some sons, and um, one of the sons said to me, I no longer have to see a psychiatrist. So that was really good. I was. Um, did that change at a certain point, or did you remain the only woman? I remained woman? the only woman in my office. I finally left that office and went out on my own. Wow. What was the experience with working with an office full of men after they had seen that you were quite an accomplished lawyer and you could go and win major cases? How did they treat you? The same, I think. <laughs> I think the same. <laughs> 
would have earned you a high level of respect in the office? Well, they were, they were, they were, they were nice. It wasn't a bad environment, but um, it wasn't a, you know, I mean, I think they thought they knew a lot more because they were men. So what did women lawyers then? There weren't that many. In fact, there were hardly any women plaintiff's lawyers then. In my class at law school, there were seven women and 150 men. The seven women finished, half the men dropped out. So there you go. Well, it was at night, so it was, I understand, you know, they were firemen and policemen and they were coming to get a law degree, so they worked during the day. And sure, but so did you, and you had a family as well. I did, but really, for most of my um, law school, only my youngest daughter was at home. And she quizzed me. <laughs> she helped you study? She, she, you know, she was very supportive. And your husband? And my husband was. So, well, I taught, after that, I took a, um, I taught at Vans Products Liability at CUNY, and I taught at Baruch. And then my husband said, you know, you've been going to law school four nights a week. Wouldn't you like to stay home a little with me? I said, you're right. You just stopped teaching at that point? I stopped teaching after that. Mm -hmm. I always love teaching. I do teach classes here and there. You yeah. still teach classes now here and there? Yes. What topics? At New York Law School mainly. Um, um, well, on products liability, mainly on products liability. Great. So you've kind of had a bunch of different mini careers in the full span of your larger careers. Well, now, now really, I do a lot of talking um, about reproductive rights. Sure. Um, and I just wrote a recent article. Uh, on the current state of affairs. I, I, I did a lot of speaking and I also do a lot of writing. Um, but the recent article that I did um, really shows the restrictions. Somebody from the Strand Bookstore asked me to do this topic. <laughs> and the Strand Bookstore is the biggest bookstore in New York. So I didn't think too much of it, but when I started to really research it, I, state by state, um, I realized what the restrictions were in other states. And also, a friend of mine taught me how to listen to the court arguments. So I listened to the arguments in Florida, Kansas, Alabama, Mississippi, and that was really very interesting. The judge in Florida, it's, it, well, there was an excellent result in Florida because the judge in Florida, and they have a revolving bench. Um, this is the Supreme Court of Florida, and the judge's name was Parente, Judge Parente. And the ACLU, I watched the ACLU lawyer give her presentation, and then I watched the other lawyer who wasn't anywhere near, I didn't think it didn't give as good an argument. So anyway, um, the Florida Supreme Court made an excellent decision. Uh, they said that there was a privacy provision in the Florida Constitution so that no matter what happens with Roe v. Wade, abortion will not be outlawed in Florida. And many, there were several states that did that, and I don't think anybody really knows that. So that's, a, um, that's important. There are six states, I think, now that have done that. You brought up the ACLU again, and it made me wonder, did you ever consider going and working for the ACLU? No, I have a close association with the ACLU. Um, I'm very friendly with the head of the ACLU and so on, and I call on the ACLU when I need to. Um, no, I really wanted to have my own practice, but, um, you know, I support them. <laughs> and so 
So in your own practice, you focus mainly on women's health reform, women's rights, and social justice? I would say that's true. How would you say your William and Mary education shaped your involvement in all of these things you've been involved with since? Well, I, I did get an excellent education. And um, at William and Mary. By the way, I think that the dean of the law school at William and Mary is probably the best dean in the country. That's high praise. Yeah, he's really an unusual man and takes great interest in his students and in the whole community, I think. Um, I gave a talk at William and Mary uh, on reproductive rights. Um, Will you repeat the question, please? Sure. How, it, how did it shape my... I think I was interested in social and economic justice while I was at William & Mary, and I sought out those organizations like the World Federal Society. Uh, I don't know why the Spanish Club, as I say, <laughs> and the newspaper and Colonial Echo, where I thought, you know, you can make your views known. Were you interested in law at all during your time at William & Mary, or had that not come on to No, I was interested in history. I really was interested in history. I think history, by the way, I watched an interview on Charlie Rose with, um, I forgot the name of the historian he was interviewing, but um, the this, this historian was asked, you know, if your grandson came to you and said, I want to study journalism, what would you say? I would say no. If your grandson said, I want to study something in science, what would you say? I would say no. He said, what would you advise your grandson? I would advise him to study history because that shows the connection between things. So I thought that was excellent advice. I liked it. I was a history major myself, so appreciate the value of that. It really is valuable, education. Certainly. And speaking of history and oral history, so you worked on the oral histories at the Consumers Union, um, and clearly something about that stuck with you because you have established an endowment to provide fellowships for master's degree students in Columbia's oral history program. Is that correct? Repeat the question, please. You have an I have an endowment in honor of Jack Weinstein at is Columbia. At Columbia. At Columbia. At is Columbia. It, is it related to oral histories? It could be. I think some of it is used for oral history. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Great. And while I was researching, I noticed you are quoted as having said that you hope the oral history department can preserve powerful stories of human tragedy, as well as the voices of people who understood the tragedy and sought to provide justice. Yes, that's true. So what do you mean, when you were stating that, what did you mean by stories of human tragedy? What did you have in mind? Well, I worked on Bhopal. Mm -hmm. um, I thought the DES was a human tragedy. Um, you know, whatever they considered to be affecting a lot of people and people suffering. I, I um, fund small women's organizations in, like in Africa. I went to the women's conference in Kenya, in Nairobi, and uh, I met a lot of women. And I thought they needed a little bit of help, you know, not a lot to get started. So that, that was good. But, you know, I met at, I gave uh, four panels in Nairobi. And I had a big fight with Bella Abzug in, in Nairobi. She wanted my hotel room <laughs> and I wouldn't give it up. <laughs> so uh, you, you got your hotel room by chance. I mean, you didn't pick, I, who knows what the hotels are in Nairobi. So you didn't pick your hotel or your hotel room or anything else. 
but I had four panels, and there was a woman there from Ethiopia, Sister Bernadette Chichi, and uh, it was a panel on the Dalkin Shield. And so she asked me if I would represent her in the Dalkin Shield litigation. And uh, she ran a, woman, a woman's clinic. So I said to her, uh, do you have your Jack and Shield out? She said, no. I said, did you advise the women in your clinic to have them out? She said, no. I said, well, when you send me a letter telling me that you've had yours out and you've given notice in Ethiopia that every woman should have her Jack and Shield out, then I will represent you. So I did that. She did, I did. <laughs> Put the pressure on and... Well, you know, the warnings from Robbins did not go out overseas. They didn't care about overseas. And they certainly didn't go to Africa. Sure. It's wild to think about, right? Just the tragedy that occurs here, but also that it's happening around the world. Well, they, they ship the same products, but they don't do the same recall notices. Sounds like you were, in a way, able to get the word out about that, or to I hope so. And I represent. For some reason, I represented a lot of Dutch clients too. So that was a problem because you had to have old medical records translated. But that was. I actually have represented women from England and France and different different countries, but a lot of Bangladesh women, a lot of Dutch women. I mean, that's great. And it sounds like even still, though you no longer practice law, um, you do go and give speeches and teach classes on all these topics. You are well, I practice a little law. I still have a few DES cases left. I still have a few inquiries. Um, I'd rather not um, practice law uh, right now because um, I do give a lot of speeches, and I'm very concerned about reproductive rights in this country. Um, and I think that not all young women are educated as to what can happen uh, if Roe v. Wade falls, and we now have a new Supreme Court justice, and we now have a president that uh, um, who are not exactly proponents of abortion rights, women's rights, women's health. So I think that women have to be very wary and on the alert and know what they, what they can do. Because they have done a lot in other states. Sure. But new, you, in New York State, Mario Cuomo will not sign the bill. I think you should strike that. <laughs> um, so, I imagine since you've gone back to William and Mary to give that sort of speech, and as you mentioned earlier, your granddaughter now attends William and Mary. So, and she likes it. Wonderful. So you've gotten a chance to go back then. Um, I just came from picking her up recently. That's quite the trip. Quite the trip is right, especially when they have so much stuff. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. She was a freshman, so she was in a dorm. She was in the oldest dorm, three flights up. The oldest and only non-air-conditioned dorm. It's a good thing she's getting out there before the Williamsburg summer sets in. Well, next year she's living in the Chinese house. Okay. So... You've had an opportunity to go back then, but do you still stay involved with William and Mary in other ways outside of the speeches you give and going and visiting your granddaughter? Not so much. Not so much. I, I think I should be because I really did get a good education there. But... Um, I go, I, we had lunch with the dean of the law school. William & Mary has a lot to offer now. They have a very good global program. They have, you know, the, um, um, I know Professor Joel Schwartz, a very good government teacher. Um, I know some of the professors. And 
I guess I'm somewhat involved, maybe not. I don't go to local meetings, if that's what. So I just was wondering, anything really that keeps you connected to the school? Well, my granddaughter certainly keeps me connected. And I get uh, a lot of emails <laughs> from William <and> Mary. <laughs> so uh, I feel connected to the school. I don't think you ever forget where you went to college, if it was a good experience. Did you, when was the first time you returned to William and Mary after graduating? I didn't return because I was going to uh, graduate school, giving talks, working, so I didn't return for a while. So I was very pleasantly surprised when I did return. To see everything that had changed. To see everything that had changed for the better. So what changes would you still like to see at William and Mary? I think first of all they should air condition all their dorms. <laughs> um, I think that um, Um, I think that my granddaughter felt that she didn't, that juniors and seniors got a, um, the first chance that, um, I think first of all they should have an advisor at the beginning, not starting in their junior year. I don't think she, they may have an advisor but she doesn't know who the advisor's name is so that's not, so I'd like to, I think a freshman needs help choosing courses, talking about his or her major, you know, so. But William and Mary seems to be flourishing. I think that um, although the population is diverse now, maybe it could be more diverse. So. And did you mention what your granddaughter studied? Did you send her down the same route that you were on or did she choose to study something else? I think she will choose to study something else. Um, I don't, I, she is very creative and um, she's taking art. Um, she said it was a hard class to get into, uh, but I don't think it should be hard. I think maybe, maybe William and Mary could expand its creative department. And, um, but we have no complaints about William and Mary. Well, I definitely think you could get some interest in putting AC in all the dorms. I think a petition could go around or something and we could I think that's it. terrible. It's really hot. But we weren't allowed to, but we did put it in an air conditioner. So she was pretty popular. Everybody <laughs> wanted to go to her room. Right. Sure. So I have a couple more questions for you. It's fine. If someone simply says the words William and Mary, what is the very first thing you think of? College. A very fine college. Good education. I always get a variety of answers on that question, so I like to see what the What do you is. get? Oh, goodness. Um, some people have said great school. I think others may have mentioned the sports teams or... That wouldn't be me. No. <laughs> you could have said the Spanish club, but... No. <laughs> I have no idea. So, is there anything you would like people to know about you or William and Mary um, that they don't know that could be negative or difficult that you think they should know? Why would I want people to know anything negative? They can judge. <laughs> um, but anything about me? Well, I think that um, that it's important to know what is happening to women's rights. It's important to be a feminist. It's important to belong to feminist organizations. It's important to work for all people. 
but particularly women are underserved um, and poor poor women older older women are the poorest of the poor in American society so um, that's not really fair um, you know uh, Well, for example, I did an analysis of the Reagan budget. The cuts were all on women's issues. And so I think that women have to be aware of what's happening to them, and they certainly have to be aware of what's happening. I, I guess most young women are, but um, I, don't th I don't think they're aware enough of uh, um, that their reproductive rights, which to me stand for a lot of other things, and um, I think that they have to be aware of what states are doing and what the uh, administration is doing. So this rolls right into my next question. We are about to kick off the celebration of 100 years um, of co-education at William & Mary. It's 100 years of women being at this school. Can you tell me what you believe to be the value and contribution of women? At William & Mary? At William & Mary and everywhere. Oh, I think women contribute a lot. Uh, you have to have... I would never go to a girl's school, women's school, I guess, right? Or a man's school. I think there is a great deal of uh, value in co-education. Um, William Mary is the oldest school, though sometimes it's said it's the second oldest, but it's actually, if you look at the history, it's the oldest school. And um, women ate a great deal. They ate a whole feminist viewpoint or a whole other. It's only a hundred years. A hundred years. Mm-hmm. Well, look what they missed before that, right? That's right. It's a school where uh, Thomas Jefferson went. It has a, an astounding history. And uh, how many women were there in the first class, do you know? 21. 21. And how many women? But well, now they are probably, they're probably equally divided. I think it's very close. Mm-hmm. Certainly more than, than that initial class. Mm -hmm. I mean, why would you, why would you want to um, not have equality between the sexes? Well, I think women have added a great deal to William and Mary's history. And will continue to do so. And will continue to do so forever. Is there anything I haven't asked that you thought I would ask or that you would like to talk about at this time? Well, I would like women, women are engaged in politics. As we saw from the last presidential run, but they're not engaged enough. If you go to meetings, um, women should be involved in politics from an early age and should continue. And women were the last ones to get the right to vote. And they have to keep that in mind. And they were the last ones to get a lot of things. So I think they have to take stands on issues that affect women and um, just stand up for equal rights and justice. That's great. Well, Sybil, it has been truly a pleasure. We are so grateful that you allowed us to sit down with you. And this was just a very inspirational interview. And I thank you for it. I thank you. I don't know if I said what you wanted me to say. <laughs> no, it's not about that. It was just about capturing your story. And I think we've, we've caught at least a little bit of that. <laughs>